Hello and welcome to the ESC TV. My name is Thomas Guzik. I am an editor-in-chief of Cardiovascular Research. And today I have a huge honor to host uh, with us to, uh, uh, here uh, Professor Christian Weber, uh, um, professor of uh, preventive cardiology and director of uh, research institute in uh, LMU in Munich. Uh, who has received this year uh, a very big honor of uh, delivering uh, the William Harvey Lecture in Basic Science uh, for the ESC 2022. Congratulations, Christian, and uh, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you very much for having me, and it's indeed a great honor to be awarded with the William Harvey Lecture. So, Christian, speaking to uh, a scientist who has achieved so much in basic discovery, uh, it's, it would be a sin not to ask, uh, what is the secret of success? And, uh, you know, it always comes to mind, is it ambition or is it talent? Yeah, I guess uh, it's, it's a little bit of both, you know, uh, as a sort of a violinist, I would say, you know, it's about 90% talent and 10% extra exercise and effort. As a cyclist, uh, I know that it can be rather the other way, so you can have fairly little talent, but you can go a long way by uh, practicing and exercising. So I think the truth is, as so often, in the middle. Uh, and I think it's basically uh, a very important issue also to find the right balance between persistence on the one hand and impatience and innovation on the other hand. Again. You need both. You don't. You, you cannot go endure too long uh, in an adventure that is bound to be futile. Then you have to change something. So it's a little bit like Albert Einstein's uh, definition of idios idiocracy: uh, basically, to do the same experiment over and over again and expect different results. That's idiocy. Um, so if you can't, uh, if you reach your limits, you have to change something. Uh, but on the other hand, persistence is very important to get to the point to decide when it's enough or not. So, so it's a very uh, a kind of complex recipe, but I think quite accurate uh, looking at uh, successful scientists uh, in the ESC and, uh, and around the world. Uh, you have uh, contributed and the award uh, to you was based on your contributions to understanding on inflammatory mechanisms of atherosclerosis and bringing these into uh, uh, commercialization and commercial practice. But uh, this uh, constitutes a, a range of different observations and discoveries you have done throughout the years. Could you uh, uh, bring it a little bit closer for our viewers? Which of your discoveries and observations you yourself consider as your biggest? Yeah, I think that, that there's again a number of things that I, would, uh, that I would like to highlight and that I've already also alluded to during my lecture. Um, I think uh, the uh, discovery that the chemokines uh, undergo heteromeric interaction and that this interactome can be used for plasticity and fine-tuning of immune responses, immune cell trafficking and homeostasis uh, I think is and was a very important discovery and we are still basically uh, using this uh, to define templates uh, for instance of cyclic peptides to disrupt specific chemokine heteromers or specific chemokine heteromer interactions with their receptors. Um, so far that there has been one spin-off company basically uh, that has been uh, founded based on this and uh, there are basically others that are currently uh, underway that always depends a little bit on the on the target and basically on the indication that you uh, that you're going after uh, but I think that that is one area then another area is basically to um, get to the point to have a better and more selective targeting of cytokine signaling. So we, we all know uh, that basically anti-cytokine treatment provided a validation of the inflammatory pathogenesis of atherosclerosis, but still this is not sort of specific enough. There are a side effects and the eff efficaciousness is not uh, sufficient yet for, for a large uh, patient population. Um, and so I think, you know, to better understand how we can more disease specifically target cytokine signaling and get to the point to intervene there uh, is another area and the example that I've uh, shown and that, that we are currently working on is the interaction of CD40 which is a TNF uh, receptor family member um, uh, with TREF6 with a TNF receptor associated factor 
that we can specifically target in the cell. And there, for instance, other than with the peptides, you need to choose your approach. We need to go for small molecular inhibitors in order to reach the inside of the cell. That cannot be achieved with, with uh, peptide strategies. So this is important because, you know, for our viewers who are clinicians, could you try to elaborate and maybe explain how these basic discoveries uh, are, may contribute or extend, expand uh, the recent uh, validation of uh, immune and inflammatory uh, uh, mechanisms of disease by Cantos trial, CIRT trial and, uh, and, and uh, uh, Colcott and, uh, and Lodoco all indicated or some of them fine-tuning uh, our understanding of how we could target inflammation. What, what yeah. your discoveries are bringing on board? Yeah, I, I think there's still quite a long road to go uh, basically to, to bridge this, as we call it, translational valley of death. You know, big pharma traditionally resorts to established therapies in order to uh, go for therapeutic and clinical uh, trials and basically to get to this stage I think is a task that I see for us as clinician scientists, both basically uh, supported by public funding and also by private venture capital, in order to get to the point where Big Pharma is interested enough to pick up this, for instance, at a clinical uh, phase two trial. Yeah. And what is the secret of this commercialization? You have successfully set up two spin-off companies and uh, received uh, quite a few grants. Uh, speaking to some uh, colleagues who are uh, basic scientists uh, involved in discovery, uh, very often you hear that you know we have different mindsets and uh, the basic science mindset is not uh, wired uh, for commercialization, for uh, uh, bringing the results to uh, pharma. Uh, but you have done this successfully on both ends. Uh, uh, can you uh, comment, uh, you know, what is this, the secret here? Yeah, I think, I mean, you, you, you already mentioned it. You, I mean, we, you have to keep an open mind, you know, you have to be open to a different mindset. And basically, that has also been a very interesting experience, you know, to, to learn what, what, what factors, what diligence is basically uh, implemented on the other side, you know, and uh, some, you know, there are also some arguments that uh, much of the basic research, you know, uh, that we do is uh, too little reproducible uh, in the hands of basically pharmaceutical or industrial partners, you know, to be really then exploitable. And knowing the other side, I've, you, you've learned basically what kind of, of diligence and thoroughness it takes you really to to get to this point. So, but I think, you know, in order to create and to get to the point of innovation, you also sometimes need to think out of, out of the box and you can't wait basically to have, you know, like a, a whole huge data box available, you know, to, to prove your point. And uh, from your experience, from your uh, live experience, how important is uh, international collaboration? ESC is uh, here um, um, representing a meeting of people representing practically all countries in the world. Uh, but uh, within uh, um, the individual research groups, I mean, discovery is done in single laboratories. But, uh, you know, how would you look at the, the, these international aspects? You've trained at Harvard University in Boston and yeah. uh, uh, you've traveled yourself in, uh, in your education. But, uh, yeah. Would you give I, advice I, to our I, viewers? I think, you know, following up on the sort of open mind, you know, I think it's very important that you, that you learn also other cultures of science, that you get exposure to other ways of uh, thinking. Uh, may it be in the US or may it be in Europe, that, that doesn't really matter. I mean, you can find different aspects or different angles, you know, uh, everywhere. But, but let, let me get back to the point of interaction and, and interdisciplinary cooperation. I think that is something that can uh, work and, and uh, require an international scale, but it doesn't have to. I think, you know, for us, it starts in the lab, you know. Basically, in every lab unit uh, we in, in, in the institute, we don't see this basically as isolated uh, groups that, that, that is basically work in closed chambers, you know, and, and come up with the results. And we try to foster this culture of interaction at the, at the lowest or the earliest possible level, you know, at the level of lab groups. That's why many of these projects are dependent of the close interaction of independent PIs already in the institute. 
And of course you can translate that into an international scale and, and, and you, you get the idea that this, how, how this would, would work. And I think as a few examples, you, you mentioned the ESC and the um, uh, early initiative grant scheme that we have, for instance, in the Basic Science Council. But there are other uh, means, for instance, we had a, a LeDuc transatlantic network uh, of uh, excellence together with, with Dan Rader at U, UPenn. This was also instrumental in some of the findings that I've, I've shown. You have alluded to the um, broader environment that uh, you managed to build in LMU in Munich. Uh, could you maybe uh, tell our viewers, uh, uh, you know, uh, how, how do you build a successful institute like this? I mean, in, in reality, the, your institute in, in Munich is one of the leading uh, and most successful institutes publishing, uh, practically every group publishing in top uh, yeah. uh, medical yeah. and uh, uh, general journals, yeah. nature, science. Yeah. How do you do, how do you select uh, your group leaders? I mean, what is the secret there? I mean, uh, basically, I mean, there's also room for failure. That, that, that is always the case. But, uh, but of course, you know, you try to find basically people with, with an, an intrinsically innovative mind. And uh, basically, then we uh, also like, you know, this comes from this culture of interaction. You know, uh, every of these projects is basically built on the interaction of very highly talented individuals, you know, and across the range, starting from the MD student, then to the to the uh, postdoc, then to the PI that that supervises this. So basically, it's a team effort, and and you require every basically mindset in that team to to come up with the result, and so and and that way we basically can can uh, can foster these these young talents, and if if we know that they are, then we, we try to encourage them also to go abroad, but we keep them. So we further nourish them. We don't send them away and uh, necessarily. And, and that's basically the, the building blocks that we had for the institute and that we had on a larger scale for the Steve G funded collaborative research center. Um, so again, it, it all starts basically with an interactive uh, effort. And I thought the secret was the beautiful city of Munich. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I think uh, many people uh, like living there and, and, and it's, it's very, very enjoyable to live in Munich. But on the other hand, in particular for younger uh, students, it, it is also quite expensive. That's sort of some of the downsides that London or Paris or other European uh, capitals experience, you know, but that's something we have to come to terms with. And we also, by the way, we also support that. So, so we support childcare and, and, and do a career and, and uh, families in science. I think this uh, balance of life and work is very important. So in your life, uh, you know, what do you do outside of work? Do you have time for anything else? You are running a huge institute, a lab, you are a clinician and uh, 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 also spin-off companies. Do you have time for hobbies? Yeah, I think you have to, you, you, you have to make your time. So you have to get up early and uh, so you, you, usually I, I like to uh, exercise rather early in the morning and work uh, intellectually rather late so that's sort of my uh, natural uh, biorhythm um, and you simply have to make the time yeah so I, I love uh, sports I, I cannot live basically without uh, exercising so doing all kinds of sports and as I already mentioned basically I I, I love cycling that has become my main main stake uh, uh, physical uh, uh, hobby and exercise during the pandemic because it's you know, so contemplative, you can be out in nature and you can exercise really hard, so many things coming coming together, so it's, it's quite unique. But then also I, I like the arts, I like literature, I, I, I play violin, I, I you play violin, violin in an so orchestra, yeah, so that's... Who is, who is your favorite composer then? Uh, Bach, of course, so that's, uh, that's a no-brainer for me. I think uh, for scientists it's yeah. also a good advice, there's an excellent paper Peter Libby wrote about Bach, yes, exactly. which we can exactly. recommend to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but returning to science, uh, maybe looking at a little bit at broader perspective, what do you think basic, which, which discoveries in the recent years you think are going to affect clinical uh, medicine uh, and cardiology in the next 10 years? Yeah, I think basically, I mean, we've started with the, with the inflammatory paradigm and I think that's uh, across the board of cardiovascular medicine, uh, also in heart failure and, and, and other manifestations, that's going to have a huge impact and, and, and to basically specify and fine tune the anti-inflammatory treatment for each of, of these settings. 
But then I would also like to mention maybe the, the dessert part of my, my presentation today, uh, which is basically the uh, neurovascular interface, uh, basically the existence of neuroimmune vascular interfaces that can control atherosclerosis and that can form circuitry between the, the arteries and the aorta and the brain in both a sensory and an efferent way. And I think uh, if it comes to future and future impact, you know, to learn exactly uh, about how this is wired uh, and how to uh, address really central nuclei by means of bioelectronic medicine or optogenetics, that is going to be a hugely exciting uh, future. I mean, we, we all know that, that stress, uh, that type A personality, that uh, uh, also social uh, interference uh, can be a risk factor you know, for atherosclerosis. And I think we are only starting to learn now how this is basically at the organic level, how this is functioning. Indeed, this uh, wiring of, uh, of blood vessels, as, uh, as, as, as it's being called now, is, is, is becoming something very important. Is this what your laboratory is working on now? What, is, what are you working on now? I think this is one, uh, one huge focus uh, that we have. And basically, you know, there are many ramifications, as I mentioned, both the sensory and the efferent arm, you know, and the, and the basically central uh, connection. Uh, plus, uh, you know, all the uh, other targets that we've been discussing, you know, this is not just something that you start overnight and stop. Uh, as I said, you know, it requires quite some time and persistence to get to the point where we have really successful translation. So I think it's good to uh, open our discussion to public and uh, I don't know if uh, there are any questions from uh, anyone in the audience. Yes, we, I can see the question. Please come to the microphone. Oh. Hello, um, I'm a PhD student from Barcelona and I was just wondering what your advice and opinions would be in order to be capable to ask the proper, the right scientific question uh, and to be capable to, um, so that it has an impact on the patients, for the patients. Yeah, I think that that is, uh, I mean, a very valid question and a very important question for us. I mean, you can always I think for, for me it's always been important, you know, to find your niche, you know, to not necessarily follow the mainstream, but to have an innovative idea and then apply that persistence that I was talking about and find out whether in, in the canon of all the other ideas it will, it will be successful. So I think that's very important, but in order to find out whether this idea may have a long-term impact uh, and I think that's why it's so important to have clinician scientists. You need to ask yourself, you know, will this have a clinical impact? What's the clinically relevant uh, problem or question that I can address with this and is this, is this helping? And I think those two factors together I think should guide you in, in finding, you know, the right uh, question to address. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. If anyone has a question, please come to the microphone. And maybe coming uh, close to uh, ending our uh, uh, discussion, and Christian, um, again, congratulating you hugely on all of your successes. Uh, this is just uh, one of the uh, stones in, uh, in, in, in a big uh, crown. Um, but uh, what is your next ambition? I mean, you've achieved uh, so many things uh, on many different grounds in uh, science and medicine. So where, where are you going now? Oh, you know, I think um, ambition is one thing, you know, I mean, it's, it's nice that you mentioned that, you know, but I, I, I don't think, you know, you should be ashamed, you know, in, if you have reached some plateau where you can be happy with yourself and your achievements and it doesn't necessarily, you know, be more than that and even, you know, uh, higher, faster, uh, you know, I think if you are successful and you have fulfilled your ambitions, also be happy and try to balance that with your family life because I think that is something very important to keep in mind as well, you know, personal life and happiness. Thank you very much and on behalf of ESC TV, thank you for joining us uh, today for this very interesting conversation about science, life and work-life balance in uh, uh, discovery and uh, borderline between uh, uh, basic and clinical sciences. Thank you very much and thank you to all of you for participating.